And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Rogers. I'm the executive director for the Kelowna Chamber of Commerce. And our apologies for running just a couple minutes behind while we sorted all the technical issues out to bring you uh, our latest edition of uh, business uh, online. Uh, as we do with our uh, variety of our programs, we've moved our Okanagan College uh, Business uh, School of Business speaker series online and uh, we'll do that until uh, things change hopefully we move into phase three and we'll have a little bit larger gatherings and we can see folks um, in person down the road but in the meantime we're pleased to be able to continue this program and bring together uh, speakers uh, from all sorts of uh, walks of life uh, representing the economy representing our business and today representing our political decision makers. And we're pleased to have a minister from Ottawa with us today. This is brought to you by the Okanagan School of Business. I'm pleased to have them as a partner. Our guest speaker, the Honorable Minister Mona Fortier of Middle Class Prosperity. We're gonna get into that a little deeper in her presentation. I'll more formally introduce the minister. We're really pleased that She's been able to join us uh, from what appears to be shaping up to a, always a busy time in Ottawa, especially discussing, discussing among the parties how to resume uh, virtual sitting. So I appreciate some of that background is going on and you have a very busy schedule. Do want to acknowledge and thank our uh, president circle members. In fact, I want to thank all the members of the chamber. We're one of the largest chambers in British Columbia, thanks to the commitment of all the small businesses that are part of our chamber. But I particularly want to acknowledge our uh, pillar members, Interior Savings, BDO, the University of British Columbia, Okanagan Campus, and MNP, Accounting, Consulting, and Tax. At this stage, though, this is uh, made possible because of the support, the generous support of the Okanagan School of Business. And joining us today is the Dean of the School of Business, Bill Gillett. Bill, thanks uh, for joining us. And Minister, welcome. I'll more formally introduce you in just a moment, but I'll turn things off to start us off this afternoon to uh, Bill. Thank you, Dan, and uh, welcome to everyone and, and to the Minister, of course. Thank you for joining us for the series. Uh, just brief greetings from the college. The school education continues. Um, much of it online, most of it online right now for us, uh, but we are seeing strong enrollment in our summer uh, programs and we are working uh, diligently and feverishly on where we will be in the fall. Um, but as I said, education continues and if I can just share a slide here, um, which it's not letting me do yet. Uh, one more time, no, okay. All right, I'm not gonna share the slide, but um, I can tell you that, as I said, education continues. And what we, uh, I want to do today is essentially um, congratulate our uh, Okanagan School of Business and Actus team uh, because the Actus uh, national competition is going on uh, right now, last week and this week in virtual form. Uh, at the beginning of the competition, the Okanagan team received three awards. One, a collaboration award uh, that for the project with BCIT relating to fruit snaps, which uh, some of you will be familiar with, but a project running primarily out of Vernon and in uh, collaboration with the uh, North Okanagan Gleaners, um, and also received a, a team advisor award in connection with that, uh, as well as our incoming president, student president in Actus received a John Dobson Founders Award, which includes a student bursary. Uh, and then the team itself and the fruit snaps project uh, was on the podium again this year in the Scotiabank Climate Change Challenge. So the typical success that uh, the college has seen in Enactus continues, uh, and we look forward to seeing our student activities, uh, our student engagement in the community continue into the next year, no matter how we have to do that. Um, so thank you again. Uh, thank you again, Minister, for joining us today, uh, and to everyone for uh, joining us virtually. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Dan, I hate to say this, but I think you're He's unmuted. <laughs> I'm unmuted myself. Sorry, uh, I should pay attention. I was busy explaining why I think it was my problem that you couldn't share the previous slide. So my apologies for that. Uh, do want to thank you for joining us. And Bill will remain as a panelist as we continue today. 
because we may get into a little bit of similar background. Uh, Minister, I realize that you uh, also uh, had some time in the that post-secondary world. So, um, and talking about education, it's a, it's a big player, obviously important to our economy and to our future here in uh, the Okanagan and in Kelowna. So I do want to thank uh, Bill as uh, representing our uh, series sponsor, but I also want to thank the minister for joining us. And I'll provide a, a brief introduction for those that may not know and appreciate that you are familiar with the Okanagan. Hopefully some of your family members in Kelowna are tuning in, who knows, uh, but want to... Uh, we had, I know you were in, in the area in March, so unfortunately that was when things were transpiring. We do look forward to uh, perhaps down the road to have you back uh, in person here in uh, the beautiful Okanagan, though today it's a little damp and a little chilly. Uh, the Honourable Minister uh, was uh, elected in 2017 as the first female Member of Parliament for Ottawa Vanier. She hails from a riding with a strong diversity, representing in itself the social fabric of Canada. Minister Forche has always believed that she can best serve her community by getting involved and taking action, something that she's been very active through her entire career to try and indeed make a significant difference in her community and with those that she represents. Prior to being elected, Minister Forche worked as the Chief Director of Communications and Market Development at, I'm, en français, I'm not, uh, that I apologize, so I'm going to say City College. Uh, and manage her own strategic communications consulting firm. She's also served on several nonprofit boards, including the Montford Hospital, the Ontario Provincial Advisory Committee on Francophone Affairs, and the Shaw Centre. I should note, um, we have uh, a couple en français uh, directors with the chamber, so I thought that they could come on and pose a, a question in uh, French. Uh, but that wouldn't mean much to the rest of us. So uh, with all due respect, Minister, uh, we will do most of it in uh, English. So, yeah, but do appreciate your offering. And I want to thank the directors who volunteered. Uh, I didn't take him up on it, but uh, appreciate you joining us. I'm going to turn things over uh, to yourself to make some introductory remarks and we'll go from there. Well, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be joining you today from Ottawa. I'd prefer to be in your neck of the woods, but we will do how we have to do. And I'm uh, in Ottawa today uh, joining you. And I, I wanna first thank um, Dan Rogers for the amazing team that you have and your really hard work that you've been doing with the Kelowna Chamber of Commerce and, and also for hosting this town hall. And um, as well, thank you for all the work you've been doing supporting the business community here in Kelowna through this pandemic. And I also want to recognize uh, Bill uh, Gillett for your hard work also and the Okanagan uh, college, how it's so such a piece of importance uh, to uh, where we're at right now. So thank you for being there today and, and for sponsoring the event. I should also recognize uh, that uh, some other elected officials are online. So I want to uh, say hello to MP Tracy Gray and also MLA Kelowna Mission Steve Thompson. Thank you for attending this. Um, I know communities in the interior are tightly connected, so before we begin, I want to acknowledge the tragic accident with the snowbirds in Camp Loops last week. My heart goes out to all of those affected by this national tragedy. Town halls like this, uh, one, are very important to me and to our entire government, so we can hear directly from businesses, community leaders, workers, and help answer your questions and also find solutions to the challenges you and we are facing. In the last two and a half months, I have participated in numerous town halls and round tables with community leaders and businesses from Moncton to Victoria, speaking directly with Canadians and hearing their concerns. And I have been listening and so has our government. Before I was elected to public office, I was a small business owner. And I'm proud to say leaders like Dan, Mayor Bazran, and like many of you joining this call in the business community in the interior, have all played a role in shaping our response to this crisis. 
Dan and Mayor Bazran have made sure to share with our government the uncertainty being faced by the agriculture sector, by small businesses, by researchers, just to name a few, of course, in the Kelowna region. And it has been so important to me to hear the realities you are facing in Kelowna. Je suis certaine que vous conviendrez tout que nous trouvons dans une période de crise sans précédent. Nous luttons contre les impacts sanitaires, sociaux et économiques de la pandémie de la COVID-19. Nous, au gouvernement, sommes donc très conscients que les entreprises canadiennes et leurs travailleurs souffrent depuis le début de cette période difficile. Tous les secteurs de l'économie continuent d'être touchés par la COVID. C'est pour ça que nous agissons très vite pour aider le plus de Canadiens possible le plus rapidement possible. We know that due to the severe impacts of this pandemic, more than ever, businesses need help to keep more workers employed so that Canadians don't have to choose between keeping food on the table and paying their bills. Our government's approach to respond to this unprecedented crisis was based on three steps. First, we are ensuring that the health and safety of Canadians is at the heart of everything we do. Second, we are working to ensure everyone is protected and nobody falls through the cracks of our social safety net. We have, as you've probably seen, introduced measures to address the needs of vulnerable Canadians from students to seniors to low-income essential workers. And third, we are putting in place emergency economic measures to address the real needs of business owners, not-for-profits, charities, and workers across the country. We are working to find solutions for all Canadians. And we know every sector of the economy has been impacted by COVID-19, which is why we have worked as quickly as possible to help as many Canadians as possible. And we recognize that many businesses are struggling. Many for the first time are struggling to provide for their families during this crisis. And this is why we announced a series of broad economy-wide supports as part of Canada's COVID-19 economic response plan. Now these historic measures have been designed, developed and delivered directly to Canadians in record time, thanks to public servants who have been working 24 seven to make this possible. And through this plan, we're providing more than $150 billion in direct support. 85 billion in liquidity support through income tax, GST and customs duty payment deferrals, and over 680 billion in additional credit and liquidity support. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which many call the CERB, provides $2,000 every month for up to 16 weeks to workers who have stopped working as a result of the pandemic. As of now, over 8.16 million Canadians have already received their benefits, totaling over $38.98 billion distributed. When Canadians told us they needed the program to be more flexible, we announced additional eligibility for the benefit. Individuals can now earn up to $1,000 per month while collecting the CERB. We also extended the benefit to seasonal workers who have exhausted their EI regular benefits and cannot undertake their usual seasonal work as a result of COVID-19, as well as to workers who have recently exhausted their EI regular benefits and are unable to find a job or return to work because of the pandemic. We value those frontline workers who have kept our country going through this crisis, from those working in our hospitals, to those stocking our grocery shelves. This is why our government is working with provinces and territories, and territories to cost share a temporary top up to the salaries of low income workers that have been deemed essential in the fight against COVID-19. And we want employers to be able to keep their doors open and their employees working. This is why we have made available the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy at a rate of 75% of the first $58,700 normally earned by employees. This represents a benefit of up to $837 per week per employee. When businesses told us they needed support for longer, we listened. This is why we 
announced that we are extending the program until the end of August. This emergency subsidy will help prevent job losses and encourage workers, uh, employers, sorry, to rehire workers previously laid off as a result of COVID-19. Employers of all sizes and across all sectors of the economy, from small and medium business to charities and non-for-profits, with the exception of public sector entities, are eligible. By being able to hold on to their employees, Canadian companies will be in a better position to bounce back quickly after the crisis. We also introduced the Canada Emergency Business Account, the CBA. This program provides support to eligible financial institutions so they can provide interest-free, partially forgivable loans of up to $40,000 to small businesses, including not-for-profits. As of May 19th, more than 600,000 applicants have been approved for SIBA for a total of 24 billion already in the hands of small and medium businesses. These loans ensure that small businesses and not-for-profits have access to the capital they need at a 0% interest rate to pay rent and other important costs. And when small businesses and entrepreneurs across the country shared their realities, we announced an expansion to the eligibility criteria for SIBA to include many owner-operated small businesses. We know many small businesses, nonprofits, and charities are worried about paying rent. Our government has reached an agreement with all provinces and territories to implement the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance, CICRA. Delivered through the CMHC, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, in partnership with provinces and territories, this program provides forgivable loans to commercial property owners who in turn lower their, lower their rent of their tenants by 75%. Applications for this program open today and we're encouraging property owners to take advantage of the program and support their tenants during this difficult time. Beyond the measures I've mentioned here, we've also introduced comprehensive support for the many others who we know are struggling at this time. This includes measures for students, seniors, cultural organizations, charities, researchers, entrepreneurs, large sized business businesses, and farmers. It is all hands on deck right now to meet the needs of Canadians. Nous avons dit que nous ferons tout ce qu'il faut pour protéger la santé et la sécurité des Canadiens, stabiliser l'économie et atténuer l'impact économique de la pandémie de la COVID, et c'est ce que nous faisons. As a former business owner, I can only imagine how difficult it has been to face this challenge. When you run a business, it's not just about financial decisions, it's about pouring your heart and skills into your community. From coast to coast to coast, small businesses are the backbones of our communities. Now, this, as this pandemic evolves, we will continue to do whatever it takes to support Canadians and the economy. And I want you to know that town halls like this are essential to me. My office and our entire government has had an open door policy throughout this crisis. We have been listening to your concerns and we will continue to listen and adapt to support you. C'est une période difficile et sans précédent que nous vivons, mais nous pouvons et nous allons traverser à travers ensemble. Thank you so much for your time and for all the work you are doing in your community. These are difficult times, but we can and we will get through it by working together. Thank you, merci, and I look forward to having the conversation with everyone. Uh, merci, uh, Minister. Uh, thanks for your opening comments. Uh, we uh, want to remind folks that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question um, for the Minister, please use that. You can also use the chat to convey that to, to us as panelists. I'll be monitoring both of those as we go through. Uh, we're conscious of the Minister's time and uh, the demands in Ottawa that will likely pull her away uh, close to the top of the hour. So. Uh, we'll manage our time back from that, but it gives us a, a fair bit of time here to have some good discussion going back and forth. So, and we uh, did uh, canvas some of our members, Minister, uh, in advance uh, just to get some questions. 
So um, I introduced you at the start, and I'll, I'll begin with this uh, as the Minister of Middle Class Prosperity. But we're also conscious you're the Associate uh, Minister of Finance, and we're going to get to the longer term picture uh, and get your thoughts on where our finances will be in the longer term um, in a moment. But on the, the sense of the middle class uh, prosperity in that role, it's a complicated task, I suppose, incorporating those quality of life aspects uh, into government decision making. Could you speak to that uh, in your mandate uh, letter? Um, cognizant, it seems everything is influenced by obviously the pandemic, but uh, from the mandate letter and uh, the goals and the objectives of having a minister of middle class prosperity, if you could. Well, thank you. And um, well, first, uh, I uh, was very proud to see that uh, when I got the mandate, we had to find ways to continue to look at what was happening across the country for families, for workers, and, and especially during these trying times, we need to really focus on how we can support all Canadians. So, uh, of course, uh, since day one, our, our, our government has been working to strengthen and grow the middle class, and, and we want, you know, we want to have an affordable place to call home. Uh, people want a good education for their kids, the ability to save for a secure and dignified retirement. So as this pandemic has brought a lot of uncertainty in Canadian lives, we have to look at how we will be able to make uh, contributions to support families and workers uh, during this and and that is the scope and the lens that I use uh, working with my colleagues around the table and across the departmental um, approach to make sure that we bring the quality of life and uh, also inclusive um, uh, quality uh, measures to our decision making and we will continue to do that because we want to make sure that uh, we support our families our health care system, our economy, and that we have a strong uh, middle class to be able to uh, have a strong economy. There are certain indicators that you're looking at. Uh, it's interesting when you even talk about middle class, uh, particularly we have many small businesses uh, and micro businesses that uh, as owners, they would see themselves as being that middle class. But uh, what are, are have indicators you're looking at to determine the, the health and well-being then of the middle class as you just described it? Well, that is, that is a really great question. That's what we're doing right now to uh, make sure that uh, as we are delivering our economic uh, emergency response and trying to help all Canadians, we will have to look in the next wave of, uh, of our recovery and how we will be uh, looking at uh, our next phase how and which indicators we should be identifying. We're talking about families who need childcare. We have to take care of our elders. We have to make sure that we take our realities and, and make those decisions. So we will be looking at how we can integrate those quality of life indicators in our decision making so that on our decision making, the programs will be helping to strengthen our middle class. Right. So we have some questions coming in on the Q&A button. I appreciate that. Uh, just to let uh, folks know, we are recording this and we'll post uh, this on our website, our COVID uh, response page on our website with our other uh, webinars and our other online series so that people can go back and reflect on this. But uh, please feel free to use the Q&A button. I'll get to those in a moment. We had uh, some that were raised from some of our small businesses and uh, members in advance. Um, so I'm going to switch gears to talk about the, the Associate uh, Minister of Finance role. Uh, particularly, if you could uh, talk about uh, a sense if uh, we're working towards a, a budget, are we likely to see that just to bring us up to date on the fiscal planning? And, and I should note, we were about a week away from getting set to do an analysis of the federal budget. So we too at the, the chamber are waiting uh, to see where that would go. So let's start there, if you could give us some sense. Well, first, I'll just want to set the stage a little bit. And uh, before COVID-19, I traveled the country in a pre-budget consultation tour, holding roundtables from Kenora to Victoria, even in Vernon, and listening to families, uh, small business owners, and, and community leaders. And as part of this tour, I spent time, as I said, in uh, also Kelowna. And I sat down with Mayor Bazran and toured the Society of Hope. 
And uh, with measures like the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, um, what we put forward is that we're getting Canadians the help they need today to help our economy come back strong when the time is right. And uh, we have listened closely to business owners and chambers of commerce throughout this crisis. We have responded to their feedback to ensure that programs, like I mentioned, the CBA, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, are supporting as many businesses as possible. So as you may know, we also recently extended the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy until August 29th, and we're continuing to consult with businesses on potential adjustments to the program to incent jobs and growth, including the 30% revenue decline threshold. And we have had an open door approach and will continue to keep that door open, listening to feedback from Canadians. So in terms of a timeline for a fiscal update, uh, transparency for us is key to our government. And as uh, the current situation becomes more stable, uh, we will update Canadians on the next steps. And again, I want to stress the fact that we have been really addressing the current emergency needs and we will be looking at the next steps, hopefully sooner than later. But at this time, we're, we're focusing on, uh, on what Canadians need. So in British Columbia, we've moved, as the Premier's described, uh, the medical health officer into that phase two, um, and then we start to look towards the summer. Do you anticipate then that timeline would be generally in the, the third quarter uh, potential, or are we going to see something? I would say at this time, it's a great question. Uh, we are uh, monitoring uh, currently what the measures that we're doing right now and uh, hopefully we'll transition to the next phase and and keep of course canadians up to date on our actions and and where we're going and uh, the prime minister and minister morneau will surely uh, at some point signal the next steps uh, when it's time are you able to bring us uh, i know there are discussions likely even occurring right now uh, with what does parliament look like uh, when you reconvene uh, is there any update you can uh, well they're in the house right now debating uh, as you know this weekend there was a proposal that we uh, extend a virtual parliament um, I, I doubt that we will all be in the house uh, because we still have to focus on our health and uh, the measures are, are not lifted in Ottawa uh, as much as they are in BC right now. So I think that we're proposing an approach where committee work will still be, um, some committees will still be working very hard. There is uh, an increase of, uh, I believe it's one day of virtual parliament and also some sitting, but uh, with um, uh, others participating through uh, technology. I think the proposal right now is being debated and hopefully in the next uh, maybe today or 24, 48 hours, we'll see how uh, we'll be able to resume and, and continue the hard work that everybody's been doing to represent their constituents. So, uh, Minister, if you could just uh, make a comment with respect to, uh, even when you look at the mandate letter as minister that you get, uh, we went through an election process uh, there are promises made, expectations to build on, uh, and then a pandemic rolls through. Um, and conscious, you're also in a minority government. Uh, do you expect, and, and to what degree, that uh, some of the initiatives that you anticipated when there was discussions going into the election are going to be impacted? Have you started to reflect on how that might impact the ministry? Obviously, the focus being in response to the needs around uh, COVID-19 and supporting Canadians. Does that mean some of the others get pushed back on the agenda a little bit on some of the other initiatives? Well, again, I believe that uh, even provincial, territorial, you know, even municipalities, we all are working together to support our communities. And we have really put all hands on deck to create the uh, emergency response package that you have seen. Uh, the CERB is something that is still available to Canadians and we're making sure to find ways for those that are falling through the cracks to be 
part of it. We're continuing to work on the wage subsidy and it will be extended, as I mentioned earlier, at the end of August. We talked, talked about the rent, the commercial rent. So as you know, the portal is available today, but we know that some businesses are struggling because the, the landlord might not move forward with that program. And we're trying to work with landlords, tenants and provinces to make this program work. Uh, so we still are in, in, in the current stage. And uh, I think we're focusing on the emergency response uh, at this time. Of course, we want to make sure that Canadians are supported, their health and their safety is really at the heart of what we're doing. So I would say that not that we're leaving everything that we had thought behind, we're actually bringing it in, but at the same time, we're focusing on uh, delivering an emergency response and also engaging. Uh, I think that we didn't know three months ago that we'd be engaging this way. And, and I think we've been really listening to Canadians more than ever um, and working with provinces and territories. And, and that approach, I believe, will, will make it uh, stronger and we'll, we'll have a stronger country that way. So I think we have to all uh, put ha our hands, uh, all hands on deck to make sure that when we start recovery, we'll be stronger to be able to, uh, to, to survive during the, the, the recovery. Right. I, I do want to go to a question that I have uh, that's been raised uh, online, but I wanted to follow up on something that uh, Minister Yu had said with the commercial rent. So what we're seeing and we're hearing from some of our members that they understand that a program is there but uh, their landlords are not taking advantage. Um, and understanding this is complex because this is provincial jurisdiction, but I'm assuming there was funds set aside so you'd be able to track whether people are actually taking advantage of this or not. Is that an ongoing concern uh, that you're having as from one government to the other with the provinces, finding ways to ensure that that's getting to the people that most need it? Because we're hearing from many small businesses, the program's in place, but my landlord is not taking advantage of it. Is that the type of discussion you're having to ensure it gets uh, into the hands of helping those small businesses that are facing those rents? So we, we know, and you, you've mentioned it again, that many small businesses uh, are worried about being able to pay the rent. And, and in recognition of those, that challenge uh, facing Canadian business and property owners, our government reached an agreement uh, with all provinces and territories to implement the program. And it's delivered uh, in, in partnership, but also through the CMHC. And uh, we will continue to monitor to see how we can either make sure this program is an incentive to landlords and tenants, and at this time, we're hoping that, uh, you know, landlords will, will understand that this is a good program and it will help them as much as it will help the tenants. So we're hoping they'll work together and we really commend the ones that will do it. And those that might be worried, well, we'll try to continue to encourage them as we all have to uh, really help each other to get out of this uh, particular situation with rent. Minister, I just want to go to a question that has come in, um, and it's in reference to uh, the CERB program. Uh, and I, I suspect in your travels, you're hearing from uh, those businesses that say, well, I want to bring back employees, but they are currently enjoying CERB um, and may not uh, uh, want to come back because uh, they're getting government assistance and finding that balance to ensure that and I think one of our uh, directors had noted it, a safety net is reasonable, but when it becomes a hammock, it's probably not. Uh, we don't want to create a hammock. We want to create a safety net. Uh, the, so the question is around, what do you say to businesses where they're looking to bring those employees, but they're saying, and, and you would have part-time employees part of this, I'm enjoying the CERB benefit, or is there an expectation of that starts uh, a closer audit and moving some of those folks off that when they could be in a position to be employed and be back at work? Yes, this is something as, uh, let's remember when we started um, two months uh, ago and when the CERB was first announced, a lot of people were off jobs because they couldn't work. They just, they needed to pay their bills. And that's why we brought that incentive, not knowing how long the first phase would, 
would be real in different communities across the country. So we stepped up, we made sure that people can put the food on the table, that they could pay their bills, and that that's the reality of the CERB program where you can have access to $2,000, but also work up to $1,000. And I believe that uh, we will have to look at how now different realities are happening or where they can go back to their, their jobs and, and start letting go the, the CERB. So we will have to uh, monitor and look at how uh, that program uh, will, you know, might not be in an emergency mode anymore in certain places and in others it will. So we have to look at really we needed to help many that still don't have a job today to support their families and we will be working on that uh, shortly of course uh, depending uh, on uh, what happens with the first phase and and we still don't know how the second phase of this will happen so it's a lot of assumptions that uh, we know uh, we'll have to deal with so a follow-up to that question we've also heard from some of our uh, small business members uh, that even though now they are allowed to start, they are facing, and it's to a small degree, some employees that are anxious that uh, while they're allowed to go, they don't feel, uh, for their own personal reasons, safe enough to return. Then you get into all sorts of labor law, which I won't <laughs> venture down. But one of the things that the Premier has been pretty vocal, uh, Premier Horgan, is uh, pushing for um, a national uh, program to address uh, paid sick leave. Uh, are those discussions occurring? Can you share any insight uh, that you might be there? Because uh, uh, the Premier even last week was fairly clear and he's trying to make that uh, request to, uh, to the federal government. So as you probably know, many conversations are happening since day one and uh, our governments at all levels have been working together uh, to keep Canadians safe and, and also to make sure that their health is the priority. And depending where you are uh, in the country, it, it will be different at this time. I do I want to say though that on April 28th, we released the guidelines on reopening uh, our economy and they were developed with the provinces and territories and it showed how our cooperation and collaboration over the past few months. And uh, we need to know that uh, Canadians are safe. So these guidelines will provide a framework for how uh, we can reopen sectors without putting Canadians at risk. And also um, we chose to uh, make sure that we continued with the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy was what something that was uh, as a conversation uh, needed. And uh, that is already supporting more than 2 million workers across the country. And uh, we will know if others will use this program as we continue by working with provinces. We understand there are many pressures for businesses right now. So we're trying to bring those uh, programs that we've uh, developed to support them. And uh, also we'll continue to consult um, key business and labor representatives uh, to make sure that uh, we, if we have to make uh, adjustments to the program to incent jobs and growth, uh, we will be able to do that. But as you know, many discussions are, are happening. It's going very fast and uh, we will adapt uh, as we go. And we know that uh, many Canadians are anxious and some businesses are anxious. So we're trying to provide that relief uh, to be able to lower that uh, anxiety that we're all uh, living with this uh, pandemic right now. Thanks, Minister. Um, I'm going to ask a question, and my apologies for bouncing around. We're having questions coming in, but I want to return to uh, the middle class because I probably should have uh, brought this question in a little bit earlier. Uh, but someone has asked, uh, is there a fixed definition uh, in describing what does middle class actually mean? And is it the same that you're looking broad uh, brushed across the country, or is it very uh, region by region based on cost of living, I suppose? So defining what is middle class, uh, Minister? Well, thank you for that question. And we know that uh, depending where you live, people will have uh, different realities. And that's why we are focusing on uh, 
when we talk about middle class, that people can put food on their table, they can pay a good education for their kids, they can have a retirement. And we're really focusing on, on making sure that the middle class can be the strong um, convener to, uh, to our economy. So we are continuing to make sure that we can provide some support for all Canadians at this time. As you know, we've been hit hard and all Canadians are living through this. So that's why we're focusing on programs that will be supporting individual workers, businesses, and make sure that when it's time to rebounce back into our, you know, new normal or new realities, we'll be able to, to support all Canadians during, uh, during the next phases. We have a question with respect to how will government confirm that uh, revenue drops are due to COVID when assessing claims for assistance? And I, the, the general question, right, is uh, the audit and ensuring it's getting into the right people that absolutely need it. Um, so that check and balance, I suppose, is the question. The system looks to be open to non-qualifying claims. So, so it's a bit of maybe the penalties or follow-up due diligence to ensure that um, is this something that's done afterwards? The CRA has auditors, etc. If you can make a comment with just to ensuring that the funds that are there actually end up uh, in the hands of those that most need it. No, it's a great question. And, and I think that because of the fact that we delivered it so fast and we wanted people to have access to the money as quickly as possible, um, we don't want Canadians to think that this is just not going to be checked. We are going to be auditing. We're going to be make sure that we follow through on who really needs it. And we will continue to make sure we put um, those, those measures in as we, uh, as we move along. So this is not a place where people will be able to uh, take uh, the money uh, if, if, if they're not uh, eligible to do it. But we wanted to make sure that, first of all, Canadians really needed some support. And that's why we decided to move, make sure we move quickly. But at the same time, we'll make sure also that uh, nobody uh, uses uh, the system in the wrong way. Um, you know, I think when people uh, go to the polls, they elect their leaders, they hope their leaders are making wise choices uh, on emerging issues, but also thinking long term. So in the, that aspect of thinking long term, uh, you've talked generally of when there might be a fiscal update, uh, you know, later this year. Um, has the government started to think longer term? Because obviously the deficit increases, debt increases. Uh, somewhere along the line. Uh, so I'm probably a generation that will be gone before some of this, but um, from my kids, and uh, there's a long-term impact. Has the government started to reflect on that, or uh, is it too early in your mind to, to start thinking of how we're going to recover post-COVID-19? Well, again, as uh, everybody knows, we've been really in these extraordinary times um, focused on making sure that uh, we didn't want Canadians to worry about paying their bills currently or putting food on the table. And we've focused on implementing measures, emergency measures, of course, to support Canadians and to lessen the impact of the crisis uh, on the Canadian economy. And um, COVID-19 is a significant challenge that requires significant investment. And to date, the government has provided over $150 billion in direct support for Canadians and make it one of the most ambitious response plans in the world. And as we entered into this with the fiscal firepower, we, we needed to respond. Now, more than ever, we are prepared to use it. Our government uh, is focused on implementing measures to support Canadians and to lessen the impact of the crisis on the Canadian economy. And with that in mind, it is still uncertain uh, what those full impacts will be. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it will be uh, very important that we prioritize uh, our next steps on recovery and that we have a coordinated approach with provinces, territories, and, and, and stakeholders to make sure that we focus on, on, on how Canada is going to be able to, uh, to come back from this uh, crisis stronger 
than ever, and also the contribution of uh, all sectors of the economy in getting back to uh, recovery. So the government uh, right now is very being very transparent with all of the measures that we're putting forward, and when we will be able to uh, have a better sense on the on the next step, we will be able to update Canadians on those uh, on those steps. There has uh, been a shift in conversation, certainly in British Columbia, but elsewhere with respect to, uh, and even uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry talking about preparing for the second wave. So as we prepare for a potential second wave, is there also consideration uh, through the Ministry of Finance and through the federal government of potential new programs or bolstering the programs that exist now in light of a second wave that may result in a, a, a step, well, not necessarily a step back because you can't go backwards, but <laughs> uh, with respect to the potential impact of a second wave, has that uh, entered in the, the planning mode for the Ministry of Finance and the government? I would say more in a monitoring mode, of course. Uh, right now, we're really following the public health agency uh, guidelines. We're also making sure that uh, currently with the phase we're in, hopefully we will uh, plank the curve and uh, which would make the second wave uh, hopefully uh, smaller. Uh, all those assumptions and, and unknowns are, are, are something that will come uh, to, to a plan where we might have to shift our, our efforts uh, knowing what is coming as a second wave. So we have to be very careful in not assuming that we are going to create new And uh, new ones, except the ones that we know right now, uh, we chose to, like the wage subsidy. And uh, the, the government is really monitoring and, and cooperating and coordinating its approach with provinces. So I know that the BC uh, government has been very clear with uh, the Prime Minister and uh, Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland in sharing uh, how uh, BC's reality as a uh, probably different than other provinces across the country. So that's why we're having a coordinated approach. And unfortunately, I don't have a recipe uh, that would uh, say this is exactly what is going to happen. So we all have to make sure that we monitor what is happening and uh, that we uh, support and we have these conversations to understand the realities across the country. And also, as I mentioned to you uh, not too long ago, it's important that we hear businesses on how their realities are. And that's why receiving even some ideas or, or not only concerns, but also ideas on how we can make our programs better is really the focus that we're, we're, we're on right now. Right. Uh, Minister, I'm conscious of time and your demands in Ottawa um, and online. And uh, speaking of which, are you in your office or? At my apologies. Are we? I'm at home. <laughs> you're at home. I should have. Uh, thank you for taking it. So, um, but appreciate you represent the constituents there too. So, I'll I'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And in the next if, I, minutes. if I may, because I know time is short, and uh, you know it's it's important to engage. This doesn't mean that uh, through you, uh, if there are questions <laughs> or ideas, and I know that you're working on surveys. We need to understand that, and we use all that knowledge to be able to adapt and create our, our different programs and you know just for the seniors for example we got a lot of uh, MPs across the country and even stakeholders who said some seniors are really having a hard time so that's how we understood that we could step up and we just did an announcement about I say a week ago to uh, help seniors with the one time uh, benefit for those that have GIS and, and OIS of up to $500. So those are things that we've been really demonstrating on helping individuals, but also uh, through the, uh, let's say business lens, presenting program that can support and make sure that our businesses are still afloat so that when we go into recovery, they can have a step to be able to recover much quicker than if they would have to fold during this uh, time. Great. Uh, Minister, as, as time goes, I, I've referred to others when we've had them on. This is, we'll move into the bullet round. So I'll, I'll try to ask <laughs> as quickly as I can uh, the questions. And, and if you could uh, respond as best you can. Uh, cognizant, these are coming in from folks that have joined us and appreciate that they have. Uh, will there be an adjustment to provide the same relief for commercial tenants that pay 
triple net versus gross? Uh, uh, good so question. Is, I, is that I, an I, issue they raised provincially or federally because it's a joint program? I think it, um, again, I want to stress the fact that this is a provincial responsibility. And uh, of course, the federal, uh, we tried to find a way to uh, work with provinces to support a program, the one we're offering. So I think I would have to go in the weeds. And if uh, you don't mind, I'll take that question back and to make sure that I answer it properly. So just out of curiosity, we, we obviously pay attention to what's happening in BC. Is the program different in other provinces? No, it's the same program. Same it's program. just yeah. because it's a provincial responsibility. Respons the federal government uh, designed a program that we weren't taking the responsibility of the province. We had our way of uh, supporting uh, of supporting landlords and, and tenants. So that's why we went through the CMHC and that's why we developed it that way. But again, I know there are some concerns and that's why that we have to work on those concerns and see how we can relieve the pressure on landlords and tenants. I think everybody wants to help each other, but the pressures are, are really strong and we'll have to, to look at how we can adapt the, these programs. Right. Next question that came in, uh, this is uh, really keys in on that balance. So earlier I asked a question that someone had is, uh, they can come back to work, but they don't want to come back to work because they're getting government benefit. Uh, but then there might be an occasion where they want to come back to work, but that work is no longer there and eventually CERB runs out. What's the government plan to help those people that uh, can't get back as the work is not there? Uh, do they transition to employment insurance? So what's some thoughts to helping those folks? Well, that's a great question. That's what actually we're trying to look at uh, the next steps of the uh, Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. As you know, yeah. that's why it's called an emergency response. It's a short-term program that we are offering right now. We know it has its challenges and it has its benefits, but we will have to see how the next phases uh, go through to see how we will um, be looking at that. And of course, uh, how will we incentivize also workers to go back to work is a really good question because some of them um, it's helping them right now so we need to really look at those very important questions and and, and find a way to uh, to make sure that uh, not only those that have a possibility of working but those that don't we can encourage them in being able to work Great. I want to finish off with a couple more uh, and thanks uh, minister for being flexible to take some questions uh, live that are coming in and thanks for those that have joined us and used the Q&A function to submit. Uh, has there been any consideration of uh, deferral of taxes, fees, levies, potentially setting up a situation of businesses facing a double payment situation when liquidity comes back? So um, it's, it's describing a situation that we're hearing, right, of deferral is nice, but it just postpones what could be a significant debt load and some thoughts around that. As associate well, again, I think it's a really good uh, consideration to take uh, into account and in that uh, currently we've done what we've done and for the next uh, phases by having this conversation we will take that idea and look at it more closely. Uh, next question it's, it's really a broad one uh, obviously with uh, being associate minister of finance you see how our economy is doing um, and we're a trading nation we're a global nation uh, this chamber and chambers across the country have also said we could do a better job with internal trade and reducing some of those internal barriers. Uh, can you give us some of your thoughts with respect to steps the federal government may uh, take to, while it's provincial jurisdiction, to accelerate uh, elimination of some of those trade barriers? Uh, the Minister Morneau had talked about, uh, I think last year, about trying to accelerate that uh, discussion with the first ministers, but also where we end up as a trading nation and making sure that those supply lines are there to help our uh, GDP and our long-term uh, economic stability as a trading nation? So uh, great question again, and I would answer two, twofold. The first is we've been engaging with the G7 and the G20 countries uh, all along this crisis, and we are having conversations on how trade is doing, because we're still 
receiving some and uh, we know that there are many pressures right now so this is a conversation that will be continuing with uh, of course the international trade minister minister ing and also minister morno myself and and others just to make sure that with the g7 and the g20 countries we we continue to really focus on that global economy and, and trade and we know that with uh, nafta or nafta 2 will be uh, coming into force uh, July 1st, that will also be uh, another consideration that we'll have to, uh, to focus on. And as for mobility across the country and intern uh, domestic uh, trade, that is also on the agenda and uh, working with provinces and territories to see how we can better coordinate and maybe even have new uh, realities that we have to bring in because of what we just lived in the past uh, four months, uh, two months, sorry. We have, uh, and Minister Baines have share, has shared that, we have a Made in Canada approach where we're really trying to incentivize businesses across the country to uh, step up and to be innovative and to really focus on the, the fact that our health system uh, will be really important to, to increase with PPEs and also we'll have to make sure that we produce uh, those PPEs uh, here uh, nationally. So I would say that that conversation will be ongoing and we should uh, really consider domestic um, um, mobility and domestic trade as being a, a focus in, in our recovery. Uh, Minister, we have uh, a few more questions, but I think what we'll do is we'll uh, take those. Are you okay if we provide those to you and, yes, and your please. staff? And, yes, right. and even if somebody has uh, an idea in a week and would like to really focus on that idea, uh, maybe through you, Dan, and the yep. uh, Kelowna Chamber of Commerce, because we will continue this conversation, of course. Uh, be able to take those uh, consideration and ideas. I know that uh, we talked about the agriculture sector feeling the pressure, the tourism in your community and your region is so important and that we know there are uh, some pressures right now. We don't know if we'll have our border open uh, soon. So it's, it's really important that we continue this conversation and that we uh, work together uh, to recover. It's a, it'll be our best, uh, our, our best outcome is if we work together. It's interesting you mentioned tourism. That will be the subject of our next uh, dialogue in our Okanagan College School of Business uh, uh, next month. So it'll be interesting to have that discussion in aerospace, uh, you know, uh, the impact on the airline industry. We've got a uh, large uh, potential for a cluster development in, on the aerospace side here. So that's important. Minister, I just wanted to give you a moment if you wanna wrap things up and then I'll turn it back over to Bill for some closing remarks. Well, I want to thank you again for the opportunity of having this conversation and pursuing uh, the fact that we can work together on concerns about our economy, about knowing that we have to have a strong recovery. And this is why these, um, these activities like a town hall happens. And I want to really commend the hard work that you've been doing, knowing that you're a very large chamber of commerce and a lot of people participate. I'm sure we'll get a lot of great feedback so we can uh, continue to bring forward um, our programs that we're delivering right now and make sure they're accessible, but also look at what will be next because we will have to uh, make sure that we focus on, on what will be our best outcome as a, as a, as a nation. Great, thanks Minister. Uh, Bill, I'll turn things back to you uh, to provide uh, just some closing comments and thank our Minister. Thank, thank you, Dan, and, and thank you, Minister. It, it, is, um, it, it is wonderful for us to know that attention is being paid and that the voices of everyone across the country are being listened to. And so your willingness to come here uh, and speak with us says much to the efforts of uh, everyone across the country and the government in terms of being responsive and addressing the needs that we have now. So thank you again for being here, uh, and we look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, Minister. On behalf of uh, our president, our board, and our team here at uh, the Kelowna Chamber, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day, and we look forward to furthering the conversation. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, merci for, for joining us. I'm going to wrap things up by just plugging our next event in the School of Business Speaker Series. We're going to shift gears and talk about tourism with President and CEO for Destination BC, Marshall Walden, along with Michael Jay from Big White. Uh, should be a great conversation uh, focusing on what does the short-term and long-term look like for tourism, one of the major players in economic activity in uh, the Okanagan. So we look forward to that. That'll be on June 16th, uh, the next opportunity to join. We're also continuing to work with the World Trade Center Vancouver. They're providing the Trade Accelerator Program online. It's a great opportunity for you to reflect if you're thinking about exports and getting into that market. There are bursaries available for chamber members uh, valued to over 4,000. If you're growing and you want to look at uh, exports uh, and finding out how best to do that, this is a session that is made for you. Uh, let us know uh, here at the Kelowna Chamber. We'll put you in contact with the folks at World Trade Center Vancouver that are managing in that program. Again, thanks to the minister. Thanks again to the School of Business, uh, Bill Gillett, uh, for joining us. Our guest today was the Honorable Mona Forche, the Middle Class uh, Minister, a Middle Class Prosperity and Associate Minister of Finance. Thanks everyone for joining us and have a great day.